So infertility. Um, it's common, commonly infertility is considered to be a diagnosis for couples who have not achieved pregnancy after one year of regular unprotected intercourse when the woman is less than 35 years of age or after six months when the woman is older than 35. It does affect about 10 to 15 percent of reproductive age couples. We have goals when we're providing care. Um, first of all, we want to provide the couple with accurate information. We need to dispel any myths or inaccuracies from friends or the mass media that the couple may, may find to be true or, or may think to be true. We need to assist uh, in identifying the cause of infertility. We want to provide emotional support. The couple may benefit from some anticipatory guidance, uh, counseling and support group meetings. And it does help when you vent and cry and discuss among people of similar circumstances. I mean, think about it as a, even as a student, it, it helps to be able to, to vent to your, your classmates about the things that are, are bothering you. Um, and also we need to guide and educate about forms of treatment, some options for them, adoption, surrogacy, uh, IVF with donor eggs, semen, or both. <laughs> Infertile couples should be encouraged, as in many walks of life, to maintain normal BMIs, avoid STIs, as well as exposure to substances or habits such as smoking that impair their reproductive ability. Okay, so factors that are associated with infertility. Um, in the female, it could be some ovarian factors. We have to assess her cycles. How regular are they? Does she have 30-day cycles? Does she have 45-day cycles? Does she have 28-day cycles? These are some things that we need to know because we need to we need to know about her reproductive health. And the first place to start is right there. Um, we need to determine if there's any developmental anomalies. Uh, does she ovulate? And if she doesn't, is it primary or secondary? And ovulation primary could be from pituitary or hypothalamic hormonal disorders, adrenal gland disorders, which are rare, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is another rare one. If it's secondary, it could be disruption of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, um, anorexia. That's why it's important for us to, to ascertain all of our assessment. Insufficient body fat in athletic women, increase in prolactin levels, thyroid disorder, premature ovarian failure, and polycystic ovarian disease. Medications also can affect uh, ovarian function, such as oral contraceptives, progestins, antidepressants, corticosteroids, and chemotherapy. There are also tubal and peritoneal factors, developmental anomalies of the tubes, reduced tubal motility, inflammation, such that it can occur with PID, tubal adhesions, such as with endometriosis, and previous tubal pregnancies. Uterine factors, again, any developmental anomalies. If she has a tilted uterus, if it's bifurcated, does she have fibroids? Does she have scar tissue? And then we're looking at vaginal and cervical considerations. Um, infections such as STIs, cervical mucus that could be inadequate, isoimmunization, uh, development of uh, sperm antibodies. We, of course, look at nutritional deficiencies, obesity, and any thyroid dysfunction. You know, we're talking about cervical mucus. Um, I know my daughter, this is kind of a little personal story, but it's something worth sharing is that her, she had been trying to get pregnant for a while. Her husband was, uh, ended up being uh, deployed. And when he came home, they were hoping to start a family. And um, she, you know, they tried and tried for, for several months. And I actually had... Um, had someone tell me that if she would try Mucinex, that Mucinex thins the mucus out, and so it increases the sperm motility, which she did, and it did. So it, it could be something that's very, very simple that's going on when we're talking about the woman who is, ex, who is experiencing infertility. Okay, so some factors associated with uh, male infertility, hormonal factors, um, it could be congenital disorders, tumors of the pituitary or hypothalamus. What if there's trauma to it? Excessive amounts of androgens, estrogen, or and cortisol drugs. Um, cortisol and drugs, excuse me, chronic illnesses. And then there's nutritional, obesity, or other deficiencies and diabetes. Testic testicular 
still it's an assessment it's a visual assessment we're going to be looking are there any this does he have any problems uh, are there any congenital disorders does he have an undescended testes um, when we're talking about uh, about the male genitalia does he have a hypospadias which would mean that the urethra is not in the expected place um, viral infections that he might have suffered such as mumps trauma torsion castration systemic illnesses and anti-sperm antibodies transport is also uh, something that we look at it's affected um, because of drugs stds ejaculatory dysfunction and premature ejaculation so care management for these couples um, we're going to do for a female uh, we're going to do a test or examination we're going to evaluate the anatomy we're going to evaluate the cervix the uterus the tubes and the peritoneum uh, we're going to look at uh, detection of ovulation hormonal analysis this will be assessed to determine the endocrine function of, of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis when the menstrual cycles are absent or irregular determination of blood levels of prolactin fsh luteinizing hormone estradiol progesterone and thyroid hormones may be necessary to diagnose the cause of any irregular menstrual cycles we're going to do an ultrasound we might even do an endometrial biopsy uh, a hysterosalpingography this will give us a visualization of any abnormalities and then we might have to do a laparoscope uh, scopy just to look and, and determine you know get a, an internal visual visualization does she suffer from endometriosis what exactly is going on internally so when we're talking to, about the male uh, what do we want to look at what do we need to do it's the same as a female we have to start with the visual assessment we need to ascertain if there are any notice, noticeable abnormalities um, does he have any hypospadias when a semen analysis is performed we're looking for the volume to be at least 1.5 liters with a pH of 7.2 or higher we also look at density motility and total sperm count expected would be greater than 39 million per ejaculate a, a male who might be experiencing problematic sperm should stay out of saunas because um, high temperature could alter that number of sperm we're going to do a scrotal ultrasound determine the presence of if there was any varicells uh, we're going to look do a transrectal ultrasound to evaluate the ejacul ejaculatory ducts the seminal vesicles and the vas deferens some things that we're going to look at with plan of care and implementation we're working through our nursing process here uh, psychosocial considerations we want to encourage the couple again to get involved with a support group infertility is considered a major life stressor um, as you can imagine and empathize some of you may be able to sympathize with this being able to vent the disappointment and negative feelings with a group of people who understand can be a therapeutic tool for these couples it's a safe haven and they may be able to gain some insight into what they're experiencing and infertility is perceived differently by both men and women women tend to be more stressed about infertility tests and place more importance on having children men feel as if they're to blame for the woman's unhappiness at being able to conceive even if the problem may reside without her because a man he feels the need to take care of his, his significant other he feels the need to, to take care of the problems that arise and when he can't fix those problems they feel they feel like they're a little inadequate um, also some important things to know is that insurance may not cover infertility and that could be a cause for a lot of frustration by couples who are attempting to conceive in 2012 there were only 15 states that had mandated some form of insurance coverage for infertility I think we also need to look at uh, religious culture concerning it how does it affect the woman's perception of health care and especially as it relates to the infertility we're going to look at the medical therapies surgical therapies they might have some assisted reproductive therapies um, we're going to go through and, and look at that on the next slides all right so um, some assisted reproductive therapies in vitro fertilization uh, with embryo transfer that's IVF ET gamut intrafallopian transfer gift same as IVF ET however they're going to use a donor sperm 
the zygote interfallopian transfer, zift, eggs are donated instead, and then there's an ovum transfer, an oocyte donation, therapeutic donor insemination, the donor sperm are used to inseminate the female partner, and embryo hosting, which would be surrogacy, and we're going to kind of break those down a little bit, and assisted embryo hatching. IVFET is a, is a common approach for women with blocked fallopian tubes or unexplained infertility or with men with very low sperm counts. The physician will collect the eggs from the woman's ovaries, fertilize them in the lab with the sperm, and then transfer these fertilized eggs to her uterus after the normal embry embryonic development has occurred. If it's transferred into um, another woman, they are called gestational carriers. I think that sometimes it gets confused. There's a lot of a lot about surrogacy in there, and so we just kind of lump them all into one ca category. But in vitro fertilization can be either with the host mother or it can be with the gestational carrier. Some other alternatives, of course, surrogacy, uh, pre-implementation genetic diagnosis, uh, adoption, and cryopreservation of human embryos. Um, again. With the surrogacy, you have a host that, that's the, the uterus of another woman, and she would be the gestational character, and she's going to house that embryo for the couple. Um, cryopreservation of human embryos may be considered by some to be an ethical dilemma. For others, freezing embryos um, and using them later on, using a surrogate or even her being able to host those, that pregnancy. Uh, just gives them the ability to have a child of their own. You know, some people will harvest their eggs and um, or harvest the sperm if either one of the partners have been diagnosed uh, with cancer. So they'll want to take those out and, and harvest those for a time that uh, that's more appropriate for them to be able to, to have a baby. So contraception is the intentional prevention uh, of pregnancy. Birth control is the device or practice that we use to decrease the risk of conceiving. Family planning, the conscious decision on when to conceive or avoid pregnancy, may be still at risk for pregnancy though, if you don't use the contraceptives the right way and if we do not instruct the patients the right way. Um, nearly half of all U.S. pregnancies are unplanned. There is such a wide assortment of options available to women for use as birth control. We as nurses need to be able to interact with these individuals to help couples compare and contrast which ones are viable for them to use. It's a multidisciplinary approach to assist the woman in choosing an appropriate contraceptive method. When you are in the health clinics as nursing students, you're going to have the opportunity to, to be in on some of these interviews and be able to, uh, to teach some of these women about the different contraceptive methods out there. Ideally though, you want it to be safe and definitely rec readily available, economical, and simple to use as well as acceptable. The contraceptive choice must meet personal, social, cultural, and interpersonal needs. Factors that affect contraceptive method effectiveness, um, we have to ascertain what's the frequency of intercourse, their motivation to prevent pregnancy, understanding of how to use the method that they're, they're hoping to use, and it being able to adhere to that. Uh, provision of short or long-term protection, likelihood of pregnancy for the individual woman, and the consistent use of the, uh, the method. Methods of contraception, you have coitus interruptus, with that is withdrawal. Um, that involves the male partner withdrawing the penis from the woman's vagina before he ejaculates. But it does have a high failure rate at about 27% experiencing pregnancy in that first year. Uh, and of course, this method does not protect against HIV or STIs. There's a fertility awareness method. Um, they rely on avoidance of intercourse during fertile periods. It combines charting menstrual cycle with abstinence and other contraceptive methods. It is natural family planning, so they're having periodic abstinence. And then there's the, uh, the the calendar rhythm method. Based on the number of days in each cycle, the woman counts from the first day of menses and the fertile period is determined according to the length of the menstrual cycle over a six-month period. 
So we're still talking, <coughs> excuse me, we're still talking about fertility awareness methods. Uh, standard days method, that's the modified calendar rhythm. Um, that smartphones have apps women can download now that, that helps them to, to keep track and keep up with that. Uh, for some men, this may also be beneficial if you have, if you're like my son-in-law and you're dealing with one of my daughters who has PMS, um, they definitely keep up with that on their, their calendars uh, just so they know what they're coming into. <laughs> um, the typical failure rate for fertility awareness methods is 24% during the first year of use. The basal body temperature method, uh, what that does is it takes the lowest body temperature of a healthy person, it takes them taken immediately after waking, but before getting out of the bed. Uh, there's there's some varying temp difference between menses and for about five to say seven days after. Once ovulation occurs, the BBT responds to elevating slightly, just slightly in relation to increasing progesterone levels, and that's during the early luteal phase. Uh, many women may use this to determine ovulation, best time to abstain from intercourse, and also use to determine the best time for conceiving as well. The absence of a temperature of a dip and rise in temperature, this may indicate that the woman did not ovulate as she might have expected. There's this, you know, there's so many different things out on the market today, like a cervical mucus ovulation detection method, a symptom thermal uh, method predictor test kits, test kits for ovulation, um, and breastfeeding. A lot of women will say that breastfeeding is uh, the ideal way for them to utilize, um, if, for them to be able to, to, to utilize uh, the, these methods, but uh, it's not. It's, it, it's not the definite way. Um, we have no idea. Now, some women can actually experience no ovulation and no menstrual cycles for at least six months after delivery. But some women may actually, and it's going to depend on how often they feed the baby. If they're having to supplement, I'll give you an example. My daughter uh, delivered my first grandson and um, she was off the, the standard time. She went back to work after three months. Well, she was breastfeeding less because she was supplementing she was still pumping but there's something about the stimulation of the the baby as it suckles at the breast um, and and so she kind of was slowing down the breast the breast milk was slowing down he was sleeping through the night so she had uh, ovulation and um, I think she never had one cycle she found out she was pregnant and we had a second baby 13 months later so breastfeeding is never a sure method for planning for uh, contraception these are just some over-the-counter what you can find out on the market to utilize for ovulation predictor because as I said some women are wanting to get pregnant so these things could be coming in healthy uh, healthy coming in and being very helpful um, there's barrier methods, spermicides, there's condoms, male and vaginal sheath for the female. Those are, those two right there have STI protection. There's diaphragm, cervical cap, and a contraceptive sponge. Now, contra uh, spermicides are marketed and sold without prescriptions. These have a high failure rate at about 29% of women uh, experiencing a pregnancy in the first year of use. Recent research, though your book does not share this, has stated these are really an ineffective uh, tool against STIs. It's kind of the opposite of what has been reported over the years, is that uh, spermicides can, can actually help uh, have a, a little bit of a preventative in there. Uh, but spermicidal creams have been actually shown to increase the transmission of some sexually transmitted infections. Condoms. It's kind of a false assumption that everyone knows how to use a condom. Clients should be instructed to ensure it is placed before the loss of pre-ejaculatory semen drops. When used correctly and consistently, condoms only have a failure rate of 2%. It's pretty good. Important teaching over diaphragms. Um, a woman should ensure she follows an annual gynecologic schedule because we need to make sure that that diaphragm remains uh, fitting and fitting snugly. 
Now, the FEM cap uh, is a cervical cap. It's the only one that seems to be available here in the U.S. It is left in place for at least six hours after intercourse. It's placed snugly around the base of the cervix. Uh, it forms a seal, provides a physical barrier to sperm, and it has a little bit of spermicide inside the cap, uh, which gives it also a chemical barrier. There are some hormonal methods. There are um, uh, birth control pills, a combination of estrogen and progestin contraceptives. Man, there's so many different combinations out there. Uh, they each can be kind of tailored to specifically to a woman's needs. Um, she can find out which ones work better for her. She's going to know after that first cycle through, this is not working. I feel miserable on this pill. So we, we have that happen. We can call the doctor and we can get put on a different one. Um, it is recommended that if a woman, uh, that, that sh well, let me just back up. We need to do teaching with her. This is important. We have to teach them to take that birth control pill at the same time every day and not to miss any doses. It is recommended that if a woman does miss a dose, she immediately, immediately initiate EC, the uh, emergency contraceptive pill. Um, and what about uh, birth control pills and, and other medications such as uh, antibiotics? Should we, uh, should we do anything to, to protect against pregnancy then? Absolutely. Many women do not receive that proper teaching uh, that if they're not wanting to get pregnant and they're on an antibiotic, it is essential they utilize another form of protection. There's a transdermal patch that's placed on the same day once a week uh, for three weeks. That one, after three weeks, it stays off. They uh, will have a menstrual cycle and then they'll start replacing it again. It's important that we tell them that they have to rotate sites. Um, progestin only contraceptives, the mini pill. Uh, some people can't handle that tricyclic uh, 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 birth control pill, which is what I talked about on the, the previous slide. Um, they just, it changes their, their hormones throughout the, the cycle and they don't like that feeling. It might make them exceptionally more moody. Maybe a person who is experiencing PMS probably uh, would not be do very, do very well on that or one who is, experiences PMDD. So that's why we have just the oral progestin, which is a mini pill. Um, and that mini pill is just, it's, it's like a consistent this keeps me level all month long. Uh, Depo Provera, women should be taught to use uh, sunscreen when exposing skin to the sun or UV rays. This med is given sub -Q or IM. Um, it can cause dark patches to develop. Once they're in the sun, these patches can become even darker. So we have to give them that teaching. Please make sure you use sunscreen. We usually administer this every 11 to 13 weeks, and we don't want to massage the site because it could make it uh, less than effective over time. Emergency contraception. Um, this may be something that some people feel is, you know, an unethical form of contraception. It's usually used within 72 hours of unprotected intercourse. There's five uh, methods available in the United States. Um, EC offers protection against pregnancy after intercourse occurs. If the condom breaks, if she suffers a sexual assault, if her cervical cap becomes dislodged. It will not protect the woman uh, against pregnancy, though, if she engages in unprotected intercourse in the days, days or weeks that follow that treatment. Um, because indigest ingestion of the EC pills may delay ovulation, we have to caution the woman that she needs to establish a, another form of reliable birth control to prevent any unattended uh, pregnancy. Maybe use condoms and ensure, again, that she knows how to, to uh, uh, those condoms are, are placed appropriately. Make sure that she questions her partner. Hey, you know, are, are we putting this on before there's pre-ejaculatory uh, semen because I don't want to be pregnant? Um, the IUD, small T-shaped device wrapped in copper, it's inserted into the uterine cavity. Um, it's a medicated intrauterine system. It's loaded with progesterone uh, 
uh, agent is Morena is one that's a very popular one that we use. It offers no protection against STIs or HIV. Important teaching for the woman, we, they have to check for the presence of the IUD thread after menstruation. We have to rule out that it wasn't ex ex expelled during that time. If pregnancy occurs with the IUD in place, the IUD should be removed immediately in the first trimester if the strings are, you know, still visible. Um, we're going to have to get that out of there. IUDs can in, remain in place, though, for a year or more to protect against unwanted pregnancy. It's just a picture um, of what you might have, just to kind of give you a visual of the IUD. Sterilization, that's another method of contraception. Uh, for the female, there's tubal occlusion or tubal reconstruction. The male vasectomy, uh, tubal reconstruction, reanastomosis. Uh, Got to follow all of the physician's instructions. <laughs> there's a failure rate of 0.15%. So educational uh, information for a woman, it's highly unlikely to become pregnant after the procedure, after she has tubal occlusion or reconstruction. Uh, does not protect against uh, STIs. There's no difference in her sexual function. There's new and improved uh, methods for vasectomies, but again, the the male needs to follow all her instructions afterwards. Um, it's a there's a, a non um, it's it's less it's it is invasive, but it, it's less invasive than it has been in the past. Uh, in the past, there there was two incisions that would go on e to each testicle, and they would go in and get the vas deferens, and they would uh, they would perform the vasectomy this way. But now they are, and this was just something I, I found out recently. They are actually going through and just at the center of the scrotum, just doing a tiny little puncture, and able to get the vas deferens on either side, um, not having to use sutures, using glue. And um, men are recovering a whole lot better from it, just as long as they stay home and, and put ice and, and take medications as appropriate. Now, there are some states that have strict regulations for uh, informed consent when it's a sterilization. Um, now we're gonna we're gonna give if that's what the woman chooses to have or the male chooses to have. I think our job as nurses would be that we want to make sure that we assess appropriately. Do they have children? Do they plan on having children? Uh, many states will permit a voluntary sterilization of any mature, rational man or woman without reference to his or her marital or or the woman's pregnancy status. Um, although a partner's consent is not required by law. You know, we want to highly encourage partners to speak with their significant others before they go through with the procedures. Abortion. It's a purposeful interruption of pregnancy before 20 weeks gestation. There's elective and there's therapeutic. So this is some ethical dilemma for, for many people in women's health. Uh, and that's okay. This is where you have to explore your ethical beliefs, your moral beliefs. You have to determine if you can take care of these type of patients. Because if you can't, you need to say so up front. And you probably don't need to go work in an abortion clinic. Now, if you feel like your calling is to be uh, with women who are deciding to, to choose abortion, then... Um, Again, you still you still have to review your ethical beliefs, but we don't need to judge one another. We don't need to judge anybody for choosing to have an abortion or not have an abortion. It is their decision. It is a very personal one. Medical pr abortions are performed through the use of medications. Um, they're mostly done through the first in the first trimester. They can be either elective or a woman's and a woman's choice or therapeutic, and that could be for reasons of maternal or fetal health. They're controversial. Again, I advise you to evaluate evaluate your own ethical and moral moral values before working in a department that performs these procedures. Quick story there. I read this um, the story about an abortion clinic nurse. Um, she had worked in the the front office and had been up there I don't know how long and I, I don't 
I'm going to kind of paraphrase a lot of things in this story, the things that I remember about it. But she had never been called to the back to have to to assist in any abortions. And they were shorthanded one day. And so she was called back. And this physician in particular did ultrasound guided abortions um, through suction. And um, so she went back there and she was holding the ultrasound wand and she thought, no big deal. I can do this. And as she's holding the ultrasound one, she watched as uh, the suction was entered in and the fetus moved in response to the pain it was feeling with the suction. And she, it startled her. She, she just didn't know that, that this, she didn't realize that this would happen. And so she dropped the ultrasound wand and, and he asked her, are you okay? And she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm good. So, you know, goes back to it, get the ultrasound back up, get visualization again. And she said she watched uh, again as the fetus moved away from the suction in, in response to the pain that it was beginning to feel from, from the contents going to be, going to be suctioned out. And it forever changed her. And she no longer could work in an abortion clinic because of this. She had children. You know, she never thought anything about it. It was just a place that she was working where she felt good to be able to practice and help women. But then, you know, it just put her with in such a, uh, in such a moral, a state of, of moral and ethical dilemma. And uh, uh, it, it, it brought her down. So she had to, she had to leave that, that site where she was practicing. So first trimester abortion would be the surgical or aspiration abortion. And then there's medical. We're going to do methotrexate or mis misoprostol or mifeprestone or misoprostol together. Um, the, the first trimester abortions with the, the vacuum or suction, that's primarily what we're going to use. Um, if we know that a, a woman is uh, aborting naturally, then we're probably going to give her the methotrexate and the meso misoprostol together. Um, the common technique for an elective pregnancy termination in a second trimester, though, is dilation and evacuation. It's performed between 13 and 16 weeks. The biggest thing that I want you to take from the abortion section is consideration of the woman. Uh, I want you, though I may not agree personally with, with the woman's decision to terminate, y'all, it's not my place to redirect her decisions. Um, it is my place, if I choose to work in this area, though, to be very careful, ask open-ended questions, clarify, restate, remain calm and matter-of-fact, and allow her to express herself as she needs to. I, I'm not there to judge. So, induced abortion performed in the first trimester is the safest and less complex, but common complications can occur such as infection, retained products of conception, and excessive vaginal bleeding. We're going to talk some about adoption. This is our last section for, uh, for our lecture. Um, we're going to talk about stereotypes and the pregnant woman. Um, the infertile couple, the single woman or the man, infant or elder child. Um, there's domestic adoptions, there's international, there's the expense, and there's also the heartbreak that is associated with it. You know, when you think about uh, the woman, uh, when someone says adoption, you think about infants and families. Sometimes there's heartbreak and tragedy, unwanted children. All these thoughts are correct, and there are many aspects of, of adoption. And the first aspect of it, though, is the woman who's pregnant. The nurse's role um, is to be the patient advocate. It's a supportive role. You do not try to talk the woman into doing something different because you don't know what you could potentially be sending the child or the mother into. Social workers, we have them available in the hospital for new mothers considering their options. Adoptive parents must be considered suitable for adoption, and they have to go through a vigorous home setting assessment period. Uh, remaining childless or adoption, that's up to the individual. Resolve is an organization that provides support, advocacy, and education about infertility and for the infertility community as well as health care providers. Placement. Why are there less children to adopt? Decreased numbers of women placing children for adoption. There's a decreased stigma of unwed motherhood. 
if you were raised back in 1950 or 1960, there was probably a huge stigma placed on you. Even through the 1980s, I can remember uh, being in junior high and having one of my uh, one of the students at the school uh, was pregnant. And I can remember us saying, oh, my God, do you see she's pregnant? So, I mean, she was probably 14 or 15 years old. But there's less stigma of that nowadays. There's things that we do in the school districts now to, to take care of our unwed mothers, to take care of our teenage moms. There's decreased numbers of teens placing children for adoption. More and more teens are wanting to take care of their babies. Um, there's decreased pregnancy rate, increased use of contraception, and a decreased abortion rate. There's different types of adoption. There's open, semi-open, closed, and international adoption. With an open adoption, um, there's a pre-adoption contract. There's ongoing or pre-adoption contact, ongoing contact, face-to-face -face meeting, and then shepherding. Both uh, birth parents meet potential adopted parents before selection. Ongoing contact is expected. Face-to-face -face meetings occur. The shepherding is when the pre pregnant female lives with the adoptive family until the baby is born. Advantages, no third-party mediator. Information is more easily shared. The adopted child knows that they are loved by both sets of parents. They have an opportunity to have all of their questions regarding the adoption answered. <coughs> Excuse me. Disadvantages. Discomfort with the amount of participation by the birth parents, is, parents and differences in opinion over family styles or culture. It works best if birth parents are considered as special friends of the family rather than the child's parents. Birth parents must be mature individuals who understand the needs for boundaries. A, the adopted child knows that they are loved by both sets of parents. They have an opportunity to have all of their questions regarding adoption answered as well. That's important for for children that are in an adoption. A semi-open is it's just that, it's semi-open. There's a pre and post adoption contact, there's identifying information, there's communication that occurs, and there's post placement meetings. So advantages, it allows them to develop their relationship over time. The current information can be passed along easily. The child's question can be answered as they arise. Maintains confidentiality while providing some limited information. Now, disadvantages, adoptive families and birth families sometimes feel married to that third party. A closed adoption is just that. Um, no identifying information is disclosed. The adoptive family receives the birth, family, birth family's medical history up to the point of placement. Uh, no contact uh, between parties. Access to finding birth parent is limited by law and must be by mutual agreement when the child reaches legal age. The advantages to this, there's total confidentiality for adoptive and birth parents who prefer it. And then the disadvantage is no ongoing exchange of information. And that child, that child's not going to be able to get answers uh, to many of their questions as they are, are, are growing up. International adoption. Um, there's a dramatic increase in adoption of children from foreign nations. The Hague Convention, Adoption Convention, went into force for the United States. It establishes important standards and safeguards to protect inter-country adoptions. These protections apply to you if you choose to adopt from a country that is also party to the convention. Uh, your adoption will be known as a convention adoption. Uh, it will be important early on to determine if you wish to pursue that. It's a faster process. Um, but the disadvantage would be potentially little history or answers to questions of the child's health and well-being. Um, and also the cultural differences that can affect parenting. And <laughs> the price of, of adopting this way um, in, for China, anywhere between $2,100 up to $11,000. And plus there's the travel expense. The total estimated cost, though, um, if, if you were to go through all of the different fees, up to $35,000 to adopt. Arkansas law, very, very specific. Um, 
The law in the state of Arkansas states that a birth mother choosing adoption will sign a consent for the adoption after the birth of her child, which states she believes adoption to be the best interest of the child, and she's waiving all rights. Uh, there's no federal law that governs any adoptions. These are completely regulated by the state in which the adoption took place, and they vary greatly from state to state. Most of the time, a birth mother will sign her consent releasing her child for adoption while she's in the hospital. After signing the consent, the law gives her 10 consecutive days in which she can change her mind, revoke her consent, and have her child returned to her. Should the 10th day end on a Saturday or Sunday or a holiday, when the courts are closed, she has until the end of the next working day in which to revoke her consent. If the birth mother is under the age of 18, a guardian uh, will be appointed to represent her to make sure she understands what she is signing and that she is not being coerced into signing anything, releasing her child for adoption. Then that guardian is going to present a report to the court along with the birth mother's consents, stating that he she believes that the birth mother understood what she signed and believes adoption is in the best interest of the child. If adopting a child from DHS, there's no cost. But private adoption can cost anywhere from $5,000 up to $40,000 and above. Surrogacy, again, gestational carrier, there's no biological connection. The surrogate is the biological connection. Um, a, a surrogate, a gestational carrier, is going to have the oval, the fertilized uh, egg from the the woman's egg and the partner's sperm, and it's going to be implanted into the gestational carrier's uterus. And she's going to she's going to volunteer to carry for the that pregnancy for the woman who can't. Um, they're not a surrogate, but they they get lumped into that category a lot. Um, but a surrogate is one who donates her egg and then subsequently carries a child. I, I've seen cases uh, in, in ICU. Uh, I think I said through, through one of my lectures that we have some kind of lax laws here in the state of Arkansas. I had a, a, a gentleman who uh, hired a, a surrogate from another state who come, came here to the state of Arkansas to deliver. He had a male and a female, a set of twins. Uh, he was 60-something years old. And he wanted to, uh, uh, you know, he had a complete and total meltdown because, or, or was going to have a complete and total meltdown, I'm sorry, because I was, I put pink in the, uh, in the infant's um, crib. And it was because he wanted to raise her as, you know, uh, non-specific gender. He, he didn't want her to identify as just male or, or just female or, or male. He wanted her to determine who she actually was. So, I mean, there, there's some, there's definitely some ethical dilemmas there that we face as nurses taking care of these types of patients in the clinical setting. Total anticipated fees, $110,000 to $150,000. I think I lost my uterus too early in life. So, but surrogacy, the traditional surrogacy, the process by which the woman, not intended mother of the child, becomes pregnant with the sperm of the intended father through artificial insemination. Again, this is what I had going on with this this gentleman. Um, there's, y'all, there's there's some some issues with this. I I read a case some time ago where um, she donated her egg and. The family did not get the child that they expected. Um, the The child had some birth anomalies, and so they wanted her to terminate that pregnancy, and she wouldn't terminate the pregnancy. So when the the infant was born, you know, she took on the role of parenting this child. That's you know really the the father of a in another family, but um, she had to seek child support to take care of the, this uh, this baby. So there's there's a lot of little legal and eth ethical issues associated with this process. The nursing role, we're sp supposed to be a supportive advocate. Um, it, it, we have to understand it's a significant loss. Grieving is quite normal. 98% who choose adoption have planned this decision. They've planned it out. Um, they know what they're going to do. I. For example, I took care of a young lady who was a college-age student. Um, 
she lived here in the state of Arkansas, went to Euler, I think it was, maybe UCA. I don't even know where she went, to be honest with you. Um, but I just know she was in college in the state of Arkansas. Her family lived in another state. She got pregnant. Um, and when she got pregnant, she did not go home for the entire 40 weeks that she was pregnant. And um, she chose not to because she chose not to let her family know that she was pregnant. However, when it came time and for delivery, her delivery did not go as expected, and uh, she ended up having to have a cesarean section. And so uh, she made the choice, though. She was putting this baby up for adoption. She didn't want to see him or her. She didn't want to look at him or her. She didn't want to hold this baby. She didn't want to feed that baby. All the things that we would encourage in a a potential birth mom or a birth mom to do before she placed the baby for adoption. It's kind of a letting go process. She didn't want to do any of that. And so here she is recovering and she lets her family know that she's in the hospital and tells them it's uh, she's had a gynecological surgery. Well, she has, but the mother is questioning me as to what is going on with her daughter. And, um, you know, is she going to be okay? What did she have done? Can you explain it to me? Well, I couldn't do that. All I could say is, you know, she's progressing as expected and doing well. Uh, she's not had any complications. So I, I can't say your, your daughter delivered a baby and she had a C-section. Um, so it's, it, it, it but the, this young woman, when the family wasn't around, she grieved. She grieved. Uh, she was she was sad that she was letting her child go and she knew that she was never going to see him or her because she had a closed adoption and did not want to know anything else after that point. So saying goodbye is definitely a grieving process. They do grieve the loss of the child. Um, they have denial. They have anger. There's bargaining. There can be depression and then there's acceptance and closure. It can cause a sense of loss that's all-encompassing, and it begins with the pregnancy itself. They're, they start saying goodbye before they deliver. Um, the actual separation occurs soon after birth. Uh, the action of the agency, personnel, adoptive parents, hospital personnel, a physician can all affect the feelings of the birth mother. We have to be careful how we take care of her. We do not want to try to change her mind. Um, and also, on the, you know, we'll talk about the adoptive parents in just a second. But, um, you know, she she might decide that she wants to pump breast milk for for the infant. And this could be something that was in her contract. And it may not be in there. She has the right to breastfeed her baby. She has the right to breastfeed her baby. She does not have to just completely turn this baby over to adopt to the adoptive parents because, you know, in reality, she has 10 days to change her mind. Um, identity issues may surface. They wonder, may wonder if I'm actually a parent. Um, if for those in open adoption, this may mean developing a new relationship with the child and adoptive parents. Um, I have an aunt who, who lives out of state and her daughter is a, uh, was a teenager when she was, I think she was 15 years old when they found out she was pregnant and they chose to adopt the child that she delivered. And, uh, she, this baby has been raised as her brother. And I know it's, it, 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 it kind of bothers me that he doesn't know that, you know, Evangeline is his mother. Um, but he doesn't call her his mother. He calls her his sister. So I'm sure, though, and I never asked Evangeline, and I probably should have, you know, how do you see yourself? What 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 stage are you in? Do you, does this bother you? Uh, just out of curiosity and, and being a family, I could ask those questions. So the adoptive parents, um, it's a transition to parenthood. We want them to go through attachment and bonding. That's the process by which the parent and infant come to love and accept each other. Uh, it's adjusting to the parental, parental role. The mother moves from a dependent state, which is taking it in, to an independent state and letting it go. Fathers experience emotions and adjustments during the transition to parenthood that are similar to and also distinctly different from those of mothers. Um, there's many factors that come into play, culture, socioeconomic level, and expectations of what the child will be like that can influence the adaption to parenthood. 
So when do you let the child know? Um, sh when should they be told about adoption? Ideally, we would hope that they would tell the, the child early on. Um, we, we don't encourage them to withhold that information because it is a, an essential component of the child's identity. Um, there's not a recommended best time, but it's best that telling them early on as early as possible so that the child, um, all that they know is that they were adopted and they were loved.